Hello and welcome to the latest Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. I'm Jonathan Davis, the editor of the Investment Trust Handbook and your host for this weekly review of all the latest news and developments affecting the investment trust sector. My thanks to JP Morgan Asset Management for agreeing to sponsor the podcast, which as a result will now remain free for the foreseeable future. Moneymakers is an independent research and publishing venture with a mission to explain and inform. But I must remind you that for regulatory reasons, nothing you hear from any speaker today should be regarded as constituting individual investment advice. This week, we have an extended version of the Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast. There have been some important news from a number of headline-making larger trusts, all but one of them with a market capitalization of more than £500 million, including Hypnosis Songs Fund, ticker Song, European Opportunities Trust, ticker EOT, Greencoat UK Wind, ticker UKW, Harbourvest Global Private Equity, HVPE, Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth, ADIG, and Digital 9 Infrastructure, DGI 9. I discuss all of these and more with Andrew McHattie, editor of the Investment Trust newsletter. Beyond that, I conclude my conversations with five more fund managers who were presenting at the AIC's annual Investment Trust Showcase event in London last weekend. As with the segments included in the bonus edition we put out earlier this week, you can tell it's a live event by the chatter going on in the background. No shortage of issues to talk about this year, that's for sure. And perhaps no great surprise, much highlighting by the presenters of the opportunities that they see relentlessly widening discounts will in due course present for investment trust shareholders. Well, they would say that, of course, but the big question remains, when is that discount widening going to come to an end? Well, it wasn't this week for sure, as the average discount across the sector has widened yet again to a new high, or should that be a new low, of more than 19%, a level not seen since the darkest days of the global financial crisis. And relentless is probably the word to describe the news from the markets this week, which has once again remained in risk-off mode, not helped by the intensifying Israeli-Palestinian conflict and fears of escalation spreading across the Middle East. One obvious indicator of that was the sight of gold breaking back through the $2,000 an ounce level and touching new highs for the last few years. The oil price, though, was off slightly this week. With the exception of China and India, the leading equity markets were generally down as well, led by the S&P 500 and NASDAQ, both of those down by around 2.5% on the week as we moved into the third quarter reporting season uh, at its height this week. The S&P 500 has now fallen through an important support level, the 4200 mark. Interesting to see whether that now leads to a bounce or can be seen as a further deterioration in the technicals around that market. The FTSE All Share was down 1.4% and the Japanese and European markets down a little less than that. The surge in bond yields that had taken the US long bond, perhaps the 30-year Treasury, above 5% in yield terms, did however come to a halt this week with prominent investors, including uh, Bill Ackman, the manager of Pershing Square Holdings, saying that they were no longer betting on further rises for now. Kilts echoed that sentiment with prices improving across the board as yields softened a little. Turning to Investment Trust performance, the Investment Trust Index was down by 2.7% on the week, which was another big number, unfortunately. Looking at the tables of losers and winners, the gainers outnumbered 3 to 1 by those that saw their share prices decline. There were some notable gains for some wide discount trusts, including Triple Point Social Housing, up 7% on the week, Next Energy Solar, the Renewables Infrastructure Group and Supermarket Income REIT, while the table of losers was headed by a number of higher-risk growth trusts, such as Hydrogen One, Augmentum Fintech, Gore Street Energy Storage, and International Biotechnology Trust. Hypnosis Songs Fund, which we discussed in a moment, was also down on the week following its failed continuation vote and uncertainty about where that particular trust goes next. On the results fronts, we had annual results from JP Morgan Emerging Market Income. Good performance here. NAV total return of 9.2%, comfortably ahead of its benchmark, which was up 2.5%. We also heard from Schroeder Income Growth, reporting NAV total return 4.2% versus the FTSE All Share 5.2%, so a little bit behind there. Vena Capital Vietnam Opportunity Trust, ticker VOF, that reported an NAV total return of minus 0.4%, which was, however, about some 5% or more better than the Vietnamese index it uses as a benchmark. Also, annual results from CQS Natural Resources Growth and Income, ticker CYN. 
Its annual results uh, for the year to the 30th of June showed NAV total return of 3.5%, which was behind the composite index that it uses to uh, measure or compare performance. And finally, on the annual results front, we had Crystal Amber, ticker CRS, where the NAV total return was minus 4.6%, which was worse by around 2% than the benchmark there. And we had interim results as well from BlackRock Smaller Companies, which uh, has an NAV total return minus 7.3%, marginally underperforming its benchmark, which was down 6.9% in the reporting period, this one being to the end of August this year. And finally, we had updates from a number of trusts, including Oakley Capital Investments, ticker OCI, Literacy Capital, ticker Book, GCP Infrastructure, ticker GCP, we heard from its manager, Phil Kent, earlier this week in the bonus edition. And Value and Index Property Income, ticker VIP, which is a trust which has a lot of long-dated inflation-linked property investments. That reported a like-for-like reduction in value of 5% for its latest six-month period and a total return down 1.8%. And updates from MB Global Monthly Income Trust. This is a trust that's in wind-down, which said that it has redeemed £23 million pounds more through a partial redemption, equivalent to around 40% of the share capital. There's only 20% of its January 2023 net asset value, which has not yet been redeemed as per its objective of closing down. And Aberdeen New Dawn announced that it is a general meeting during the week. Nearly 100% of the votes were cast supporting the resolution to approve the proposed merger with Asia Dragon. Ticker DGN. As always, you can find your way if you are a subscriber to our Moneymakers Circle Premium offering. All the details of these results and updates, as well as a table of the biggest movers in share price, NAV and discount terms, plus this week's profile, which features Pacific Assets Trust, ticker PAC. And that will be followed next week by a profile of the Brunner Investment Trust. On then to my review of the week with Andrew McHattie, editor of the Investment Trust newsletter. So, Andrew, my first question, I guess, has to be about the markets generally. We last spoke back in early September. And of course, a lot of people were hoping then that things were going to uh, look up as we went into the final quarter. But of course, since then, it hasn't been really a very encouraging picture out there. Bond yields continue to rise, particularly at the long end of the curve now, which is not necessarily a good sign. So people who are expecting a turn up in the fortunes of the investment trust sector have had to be patient. Is that a fair way of putting it? Yes, I think our mood hasn't lifted yet. We're still waiting for the good times to roll. And I think most people who had been perhaps hoping for a last quarter recovery are pushing that into 2024 now. So the envelope just keeps getting pushed. And um, it has been a miserable time, actually, for most equity markets, almost without exception, and most alternative asset areas as well. And that's been reflected really right across the investment trust sector, where there haven't been many bright spots at all. Buyers seem to be deterred massively by the interest rate environment and by the general pessimism that surrounds almost everything as a result. And I've had a look at the discount position of the market, and I do think it's really becoming quite unusual now in an historical context. So only 5% of investment trusts in the data set that I use are now trading on a premium. That's okay. That's not particularly abnormal, I wouldn't say. But it's at the other end, I think, where the figures become more striking. So 20% of the data set actually uh, have a discount over 30%, which I think is really quite extraordinary. And it's a third of the total have a discount over 20%. But it's those really wide discounts that were once associated with trusts in real distress, with very specific problems to address that now seems to have spread much more widely. And there are perfectly good trusts, in my opinion, trading on these extremely wide discounts. And of course, we've been saying that for quite some time now. uh, And I feel as though I've been crying wolf a little bit. But they do seem to me to be creating great opportunities. 
And if you are prepared to be patient, and obviously our patience is being stretched a little bit, then I feel that things you're buying now on these wide discounts really ought to look a lot better when times improve. So there's two options I would guess you could say from here. One is you just sit it out if you've been around in these things for a long time. And secondly, you start to look for bargains if you've got any spare cash available. Do you think that people should be actively rotating their portfolios to take advantage of some of these opportunities or should they just be sitting out? Depends where you start from, of course. It does. And, that, and that's a $100 million question, really. Should, should you be active or not? I think it depends what you're holding, of course, because there are not many trusts now that are obvious sells on a valuation basis. Nearly everything has fallen to a discount. And that's quite interesting as well, that I think it speaks to the very broad nature of this derating that we've seen, that I was looking at the Z scores right across the market, which measures really how cheap trusts are compared to their historic range. And there are very good trusts that I, I think will be held by many investors and regarded as core holdings. Things like City of London and Lord Adventure, Linsall Train, Murray International, Fidelity European Values, BlackRock World Mining, the list goes on. Those are all cheaper than they have been over the last 12 months on an average basis. And so I think that makes it quite difficult to determine what you would sell in your portfolio in order to rotate into some of these high discount names. So I'm not convinced that that is good policy. I think if you have a portfolio that is structured to give you a high income, and of course, many dividend yields are very high at the present time, if you're not using all of that income, then that's a nice option you have to recycle some of that into the trusts that appear cheapest at the moment. That's the kind of policy that I'm following myself. Obviously, that hinges on whether your portfolio is generating any income for you. Let's talk about the news from the investment trust sector itself. And there has been a, quite a lot of it this week. It's been a very interesting week for that reason. Why don't we start with one that seems to always attract a lot of attention, which is Hypnosis Songs Fund, ticker S-O-N-G, which had their meeting this week to vote on a continuation vote, whether the trust should continue in its present form, and also a vote on the proposed disposal of about 20% of the music catalogue that they have. Why don't you fill us in on what's been happening there? Well, there has been an enormous amount of media coverage about Hypnosis Songs Fund. And uh, with apologies to Simon Elliott, I know you like a Barry Manilow lyric, so I'd say this has been whirling like a cyclone in my mind uh, for quite <laughs> for a while. There's been an avalanche of news here, which has culminated in the AGM and EGM held this week, at which shareholders were asked to vote on the proposed asset sale, which was around $400 million worth of assets from the Songs portfolio, and also the continuation of the trust, and finally also to re-elect directors. Now, shareholders actually voted quite stridently here, with more than 80% of the votes cast against the asset sale, which was perhaps no surprise, a similar percentage against continuation, and also against the uh, re-election of the chairman, who'd already decided to resign. So this leaves the trust now in an interesting position with a great deal of work to do. And there's really so much to it that I had to write a little list. So I think there are five key elements here. The first thing is that the trust needs to create a new board for itself because it only has three directors left from the six. And those directors do have specific knowledge and experience in the music industry. So I think that's really good. But they need a new chairman. And a report from The Times this morning suggested that the outgoing Roundhill Music Royalties chairman, Rob Naylor, may be a good fit. But we'll have to wait and see. But they need a, a very strong chairman, I think, with very relevant industry experience here to see them through this next period. And they need some other directors. The second thing is, once the board is in place, they need to determine what they're going to do about the management arrangements, because there has clearly been a breakdown of confidence with the existing manager and the arrangements in place for the portfolio. And there are quite a few options here. 
which I think range at one end from sacking the manager and basing that on some degree of negligence, which gets you out of some of the penal elements of the payoff required, to keeping the manager at the other end with a perhaps revised management arrangement, perhaps a lower fee, perhaps take out some of the clauses that are in there. But of course, there are a limited number of people who have the capacity to manage this fund. And also, the links with hypnosis go very deep because, for example, they collect the royalties and arrange to collate all of the income that's coming in, which is no easy task from a song portfolio. And that leads on to task number three, which is to sort out the assets and what you're keeping, what you're selling, and to make sure that the portfolio is in good order And there is some work to do there because, of course, this leads on to point number four, that the trust has debt issues and it's getting close to breaching its covenants. That's why it passed its dividend for the quarter and it needs to perhaps reset the dividend, try to pay down some debt with some limited asset sales. We'll have to see what happens there. And then the fifth and last point, I think, is to sort out the valuation because Clearly, with the shares trading on a 50% discount to the last NAV and also the proposed asset sale being at a chunky discount of over 20% to the last NAV, I think many investors don't have faith in that any longer. And I think the recent issues with the value of Citroen Cooperman, where it also reduced the expected royalty payments that were had been accrued, again, undermined confidence in the valuation. So, I think perhaps some new parameters need to be set there and and the valuation reset. So that was a very long answer. I'm sorry about that. But there's a great deal on the agenda here for the trust and a great deal of uncertainty, which is, I think, why the shares are still trading on this 50% discount to the the last NAV. We don't really know what's going to happen. Right. It's been an interesting test case anyway. If we could just quickly talk about some of the lessons we might draw from this. But we have seen asset value investors, among others, and lots of shareholders being consulted and putting their views across. And to that extent, the process of engagement has been working quite effectively, even if a little belatedly, perhaps. In other words, shareholders have, have basically forced the trust to change its ways. This wouldn't happen unless a significant number of shareholders actually thought there was still some value in this particular trust. Because normally, we have an 80% vote against continuation. The thing would be wound up sort of straight away normally. But I think the takeaway that I've been reading into this is that a lot of shareholders still think this is an interesting asset class. There's a huge question over valuations, obviously, that's clear. But there is some hope that this thing might actually still turn out to be an interesting investment vehicle, given time and given this kind of clear up process that you've been describing. Yes, we don't know yet whether the trust will ultimately continue. The board has six months now to give us some proposals. And actually, there's quite a lot of wiggle room in that. So I think that time could be extended. And we don't know, actually, whether it will continue, whether it will be wound up, whether some other bid for the portfolio or indeed for the company as a whole will be received. So that is all to be worked out. But you're right, this actually was a very good demonstration of shareholder democracy in action. And a useful reminder that the boards of trusts and the managers actually all work for shareholders who ultimately, in nearly all cases, do determine the actual future direction of the trust. So, as you say, a test case, and it's been an unfortunate one, but underlying it are some very good assets that do generate good income. So it would be a shame to see it leave the sector. The share price I'm looking at at the moment is 74p, and that is pretty much close to the lowest it's been this year. So, as you say, the immediate market reaction has been not to mark them up. There's activity to come, but uh, not yet results, shall we put it that way. (laughs) Let's move on to another situation, which is uh, maybe relevant to the discussion we've just been having, which is the one involving European Opportunities Trust. The interesting development here is that there's been an activist fund manager called Saba Capital, which is an American outfit, which has a track record of going after closed-end vehicles, which are at a discount both here and in the US. They have, I think, significant interest in at least 10 investment trusts in the UK because they see value in forcing boards into action. And the first one they've talked openly about is European Opportunities Trust. So why don't you fill us on the background of this one, Andrew? I think this relates to these wide discounts we've been talking about. These have triggered 
action from within the industry, hence a lot of action from boards and instigating buybacks and that kind of thing, but also action from outside the industry. Certainly shareholders count there. And what we might term vultures, uh, we've seen before these so-called vulture funds coming to the investment trust sector to try and close up these discounts. And we've known about Saab Capital's interest for a few months now because they did declare these stakes some time ago. But now I think the focus is somewhat sharper because, as you say, they have broken cover and they've spoken about European Opportunities Trust, where they say they are planning to vote against the conditional tender offer that the trust has proposed and also against continuation because they feel that the trust proposals are essentially too soft and they'd like some rather firmer, harder proposals to try and get the discount in. And they do have these stakes in quite a number of trusts, including Edinburgh Worldwide, BlackRock Smaller Companies, JP Morgan European Discovery, Herald, Pershing Square Holdings is another one. And what is interesting as well here is that now that Saba Capital has been receiving a bit more attention, I've also read that it's thinking of raising another $500 million to back this strategy. So we may be in the early stages of engagement with Saba Capital, and it looks like they mean business. So we may as well see some discount narrowing in these trusts in which they've declared their stakes. So obviously, the the hope if you're a shareholder in any of these trusts is that the known presence, if you like, of this uh, vulture fund, if you want to give it that name, on the register will also trigger more reaction from other shareholders, other you know, larger shareholders, and will actually force change. So that is an interesting. In case of EOT, European Opportunities Trust, this is managed by Alex Darwell, who spent many years managing this trust for Jupiter Asset Management, but then set up on his own a few years ago through a firm called Devon Asset Management. But they've had some problems, have they not? The issue is he had a very good long-term track record, Alex Dahl, with his particular style of investing. But uh, for the last five years, as Saba have pointed out, the performance has been not at all up to previous standards. Alex was a real superstar of the sector. And when I was writing about him 10 years ago, it was always from his position at the very top of the pile, actually. And if you were selecting any European trust at the time, for Grace, you would certainly be looking at his trust. Unfortunately, his superb track record was interrupted quite rudely by a wire card and the, the scandal that surrounded that, where unfortunately he had a large stake and lost a big chunk of shareholders' money there. And it's been quite difficult for him to recover his reputation actually since, because he's a Grace investor. And of course, Grace has been very much out of fashion. And I think there's a good case to be made, actually, to be patient with his management. I think he has proven ability and great skill. So this is the difficulty, I think, with assessing the, the value of these stakes that are held by cyber capital and what's going to happen. Because yes, on the one hand, I think it's a nice catalyst to recover some shareholder value and to narrow those discounts. You hope that will happen. But I don't think it's necessarily a good outcome if there's a real pinch point and some of these trusts are forced to wind up because they're not necessarily bad trusts. They're just trusts that have perhaps gone through some poor times or their investment strategy has been out of favour. And I think that's the case with European Opportunities Trust. So I, for one, would be quite sad if this were to disappear. That's not my expectation and I, I hope that won't happen. So, I mean, what Saba Capital are asking for is for the proposals that the uh, the board has put forward so far, which is to have a 25% redemption opportunity. They want a bigger chunk of the capital to be returned to shareholders that is currently being proposed, rather than putting a maximum limit on it. I mean, this trust is quite a large trust. It's still got, uh, I think, a market capitalization, what, of around 730 million or something like that. So even if it was to lose more than 25% via redemptions, it will still be a significant trust in terms of size and certainly wouldn't fall into the unviable category. Would you like to hazard a guess at whether this particular campaign by Saba will succeed? I mean, will the board change its mind about what to offer shareholders when it comes to the vote on this particular proposal? As you rightly say, it's a guess. But my feeling is that the board will respond and will probably beef up the proposals that it's made. And I think there's plenty of scope to do that because actually this was a conditional tender offer 
in uh, three years' time, which was contingent upon some further performance hurdles. And I think actually there's plenty of scope to change it and to make it a little stronger and to reach a compromise with Saba. And it'll be interesting to see how this plays out because I think it could form a template for how Saba then interacts with some of these other trusts. So this is an important moment, an inflection point almost, and I think we need to watch it carefully. The vote on this one is coming up. It's a continuation resolution at the AGM, which is on the 15th of November. So that is only in a few weeks' time. So we will know how this one plays out quite soon. And as you say, there may well be things to read across to other situations, including those in which Saba has declared a position. I noticed that in some cases they have 10% or more of the share capital, certainly in BlackRock, smaller companies, Edinburgh Worldwide and JP Morgan European Discovery, while the others disclose stakes are a little bit lower. Let's talk about another trust which has been in the news this week, Digital 9 Infrastructure, ticker DGI9. This is, a, again, another quite significant trust. It's a recent newcomer to the sector, has a market cap still of around 500 million or so, but I think has the dubious distinction of being one of the very largest discounts that you will find out there. And it had all sorts of issues around whether it can finance its investments, which are in what would otherwise be an interesting uh, sector, digital infrastructure. What's the story on this one, Andrew? What do you make of what they had to say this week? It's a really interesting one, this one. Digital 9 infrastructure effectively came to the market as part of that big wave of infrastructure trusts raising capital. And I think it always planned to continue raising capital, which had been very much the model that had been followed by a number of trusts up till that point. And of course, that strategy was interrupted by the rising interest rates and the widening discounts, which then made it impossible to raise new equity capital. And as a result, the trust found it had a cash crunch and it effectively then had to try and realise some value from its portfolio. So it was able to syndicate part of its stake in a, a very successful holding, actually, called Vern Global. And that has got it out of the, its immediate problem. But it has now said that actually after speaking to shareholders, it's considering a potential sale of the entire Vern Global business. And that could actually realise a great deal of value for shareholders. And also because that is a large proportion of the assets, it suggests that the trust could potentially then wind up. Now, this is interesting because of that very wide discount you mentioned, and the shares are trading just under 40 pence, having not moved very much actually on this news. And this is interesting because of the potential for the capital returns from a wind-up of the trust. And there has been some research done into this. I noticed a note this morning from uh, Liberum Capital, which went through actually various scenarios that could play out here. And their worst case scenario from a wind up and an asset sale at quite poor prices was that that would realise 61 pence per share of assets. And the best scenario was 123.5 pence worth of assets per share. So in both cases, there's a very large uplift to the current share price. And it does beg the question, well, why haven't the shares moved up more? Why are people not jumping aboard here? And I suppose there's always a considerable amount of uncertainty. We don't yet know whether Vern Global will be sold, whether any good bids will be received for that, although I think it's a very good quality asset, so I would imagine that would be the case. But this is another example of the potential here for actually quite a lot of jam tomorrow. I mean, I think there's very large scope for a massive uplift here. Clearly, there's risk on the downside as well, which is why the shares are where they are. But if you are a more speculative investor and you have an appetite for a bit of risk in your portfolio, then I think this is one to look at. This is similar in a way to the music royalty story. From what I gather from talking to shareholders in this one, I mean, people do, again, like the asset class. They know that digital infrastructure is an exciting place to be and there's lots of growth potential there. The problem for this one, as you say, has been that it's actually kind of overcommitted, if you like, by making large investments that it hadn't yet fully funded. 
and uh, was hoping to do so by equity, and now being left with a debt issue, balance sheet in some trouble, they need more cash. And Vern Global is going to be a very significant drawer of cash, uh, have a lot of CapEx requirements in its future. So you can see the argument for saying, well, let's just get rid of it if we can get a decent price for it now, and then concentrate on what else we've got left and make a future out of that rather than necessarily winding up the whole thing. Would you agree? I mean, this is an interesting asset class. There's another investment trust out there, Cordiant Digital, which has also suffered in the wake of what's been going on with Digital 9. What do you make of that one? I get noises that they rather think that they've been unfairly punished by comparison with DGI 9. Well, I think pretty much all investment trust boards feel they're being rated unfairly at the present time. And Cordiant is on a 49% discount. So certainly, I think inevitably, if there are only two or three trusts, I think just the two really in this sector, people are going to read across from one to the other. And it does mean that if one runs into problems, that does probably reflect unfairly on the other. So yes, again, Cordiant is worth looking at. I think it does probably also get overlooked because most of the media noise surrounds Digital 9 at the present time. So yes, again, worth looking at. But of course, if you look at any list of discounts across the infrastructure sector now, whether it's digital infrastructure or renewable energy or the old fashioned, you know, PPI infrastructure, the discounts are tremendously wide right across there. So you have quite a long shopping list of potential targets. And I think it's quite difficult to judge which ones you should actually put into your basket. Indeed, that is true. One of the most popular investment trusts in the renewable sector is Greencoat UK Wind. They put out their third quarter NAV this week, saying it was basically flat, with some reductions in its near-term power price forecasts, offset by an uplift from its London Array wind farm that it bought recently. But more significantly, perhaps, is that it actually announced a 14% increase in its dividend target for 2024. This trust is notable for the fact that it actually has a policy of increasing its dividend every year, at least in line with retail price inflation, the only trust that actually does that. Are there any kind of read acrosses from what they've had to say this week? There's quite a lot to unpack here. To begin with, this is a popular trust, partly because of its size. It has 3.8 billion of net assets. So it's very large, liquid, easy to trade. And it's done well, actually. It has a good track record. Now, it's always stood out in the renewable infrastructure sector as having a relatively high sensitivity to power prices. And for that reason, it has sometimes been marked down a little and had a wider discount than some. But what has happened here is that the board has effectively reacted to the wide discount situation and is trying to determine what it can do about that. And so many boards are looking for a good policy now to try to get their discounts in. People are trying different things. Now, with Greencoat UK Wind, there are effectively two strands to this. The first thing is this increase in the dividend. They have very good dividend cover here of around two times. So they have the scope to do this. And they are putting it up by just over 14% to 10 pence per share. They're actually going to pay out a larger dividend for their fourth quarter payment this year to get the 2023 dividend up to this level. And then they're committed to that for 2024. So effectively, they're saying to shareholders, you're undervaluing us here and we're going to increase your yield to try to make it a bit more attractive. And at the same time, they're also going to introduce a £100 million share buyback policy. So they can do this because they have been generating excess returns from their portfolio, which has been doing well. So that gives them the flexibility to pursue this policy. So in their case, they are trying this combination of buybacks and higher dividends, also returning more capital to shareholders in that way, as a combination to try to impress the market. And at the moment, the discount is around 20%, which is narrower than quite a number of trusts in the sector, but it's still wide in historic terms here. That's why the board has acted. Of course, some other trusts in the renewable energy sector don't have the same flexibility as as Greencoat UK Wind does. A lot of them do have well-covered dividends, but they don't have the same flexibility to juggle between these 
various options that boards have between share buybacks, between reducing debt and between paying a higher dividend. Not every trust can do that, can they, in the current market? Because their assets are either illiquid or they don't have the same cash flow profile as uh, Greencoat UK Wind does. You're right about that, Jonathan. And it's interesting now that boards have different approaches. They're trying different strategies to try to deal with these issues. And it was quite notable, actually, that Greenco UK Wind decided not to pay down debt with this excess capital. It's more about giving it back to shareholders. And Gore Street Energy Storage Fund, GSF, is another interesting trust on another very wide discount. It's actually 44%, which is extremely wide, actually, both against its own history and very much against the sector as well. And that's because these battery storage trusts have been particularly punished, I think, in this sell-off. Now, Gore Street has decided again there's something it can do here. So it's actually taken out a fresh $60 million loan to fund the remaining capital costs for its big rock project in California. And that's interesting because it's actually taking on more debt at this point rather than paying it down. And it's doing this so it can free up capital elsewhere in its portfolio to make sure that it is completing the full range of its development portfolio. And that's what it's set out. That's what it's doing. So it's saying to shareholders, look, we do have flexibility in our capital structure here. We can move forward. We can grow as promised. And we're delivering exactly what we've told you we're going to deliver. And so that's an alternative approach. I must say that hasn't paid off now in share price terms either. There hasn't been really any positive reaction of note to this news from Greencoat UK Wind or from Gore Street Energy Storage Fund. I think there's just a lack of buyers and they're not impressed by any of these manoeuvres. But that doesn't mean they're not good manoeuvres that won't pay off in time. So again, I think there's just this valuation gap here that you can jump into and take advantage of if you're a well-informed investor. I suppose the counter argument in the case of Gore Street Energy Trust is that if you are trading at a discount, you have to be pretty confident in the returns you're going to make from new or existing uh, investments in order to make a better return than buying your own shares, given the discount you're trading on, assuming that the NAV is correct. The numbers just look so overwhelmingly in favour of doing a share buyback if you have the flexibility to do that. So I'm not totally surprised that perhaps this Gore Street energy uh, storage announcement has not gone down quite as well as uh, perhaps they hoped. Let's also then talk about another trust that has been conducting a strategic review, which is often a code for saying we're in trouble and we may have to do something drastic, even possibly close down our trust. And that's one is uh, Aberdeen Diversified Income and Growth, ticker ADIG, which is, uh, as its name suggests, it's in the uh, flexible investment sector. And it invests across a range of assets, including uh, private assets. What's the story on this one? Well, Aberdeen, as a fund management house, has been very active in rationalising, that's the polite word for it, its portfolio, and reducing some of the trust management commitments it has. And this trust announced a strategic review back in June, And I think it was probably hoping that it might be bought, actually, or it might be able to merge with another investment trust. And it did have discussions on that basis and told the market that it was actively pursuing some of those leads. One would have to assume they came to nothing or certainly nothing at the right price, because now the trust has issued a new set of proposals, which are rather more muted and less dramatic but effectively involve a phased return of capital to shareholders over time. So what they're proposing is to pay some special dividends where those are feasible, to introduce a tender offer, to return about 30 to 35 million pounds of capital, which is about 10% of the overall net assets here. And they're going to continue investing because they believe actually the potential returns from their sectors are still attractive. But the difficulty here is that around 60% of the assets in the trust are private. So you can't just liquidate this trust. And I think this was a 
key factor that probably got in the way of a merger with another trust, that these are lumpy assets that are difficult to dispose of. But the good news is that about a third of the portfolio is due to be realised within the next three years. And I think shareholders can look forward to some higher returns to come. But the interesting decision here, I suppose, is whether you return a fairly full amount of capital slowly, which is what I think this trust has decided to do, or whether you take a haircut on those assets and have a bit of a fire sale and return capital immediately. And I think you could make a case for either of those. So whilst I think these proposals are all very sensible and an improvement on where we were, I don't know whether shareholders, again, are very impressed because I think they were probably hoping to get some capital back now, even if that meant they weren't achieving a very full price for those assets. Because, of course, if you're getting capital back now as an investment trust investor, you can then recycle it into a number of these other interesting big discount opportunities. Uh, Perhaps one of the issues with this trust is that well, it's not insignificant in size. It has a market cap of around 230 million, but it has changed its strategy about three or four times in the last few years. It's been looking for a sustainable uh, model, if you like. And I think that perhaps has not inspired a huge amount of confidence from the market anyway. It trades on a 30% discount. And I would have thought it could have quite a, a sort of long road to resolve this one, given, as you say, that there doesn't appear to be a potential bidder on the horizon. That's right. I think in the notes surrounding these proposals, it did talk about some of them actually being realised as late as 2032. So you're right about the long runway here. And to trust it's a little bit hamstrung by its own history, which was very much as an income trust. And so I think many of the shareholders have an expectation here of achieving a good yield. And so that has to be generated. And of course, really, the trust has just found itself in the wrong place at the wrong time when privately held assets have been derated so massively. I don't think that reflects badly on the management. But again, it's not a particularly compelling proposition, I think, for new investment. Let's talk about one you mentioned earlier, Pershing Square Capital, run by uh, hedge fund manager Bill Ackman, who's a very high profile in the States and interestingly is on that list of Saba Capital's holdings that you mentioned earlier. Bill Ackman's had something to say this week, both about the bond market and about the very large derivative positions that this trust likes to take, uh, demonstrate how clued in they are, and of course, as a hedge fund would want to be. What are your thoughts on this one? It's a real oddity, Pershing Square Holdings, that's for sure. So this week, Bill Ackman announced that he had banked a very large profit on the short position he'd taken in US bonds. So the profit here was around $200 million on these derivative positions. And this is not the first time the trust has banked a very large return from its derivatives. It did so very famously, actually, at uh, the start of COVID when the market dived so steeply. This trust actually benefited because it had some very large put options in its portfolio. So it's done very well, actually, from these large macro calls. But those sit a little bit uneasily with what this trust is all about, because it has a core portfolio of actually very sensible, quite conservative, high quality US companies. But then it incorporates an awful lot of noise around that, which is Bill Ackman's other activities, things he likes to do, which involve these macro calls, and activity with SPACs in the US and taking smaller positions that can grow large and taking the stake in universal music. So it's a bit of a mishmash of different assets and positions. And I think that makes it very difficult for investors to judge. And that maybe explains why it's on this very wide discount of 38% in spite of this being a FTSE 100 company, it's amongst the most liquid of all investment companies. And partly because of the very large return from those put options when the market crashed, it's got a tremendous track record as well. Over five years, this trust, uh, according to my data set, is ranked fourth of just over 250 investment companies. 
And over the last six months, again, it's ranked 14th out of 279 in NAV terms. So it's a very strong performer. It's very liquid. It has a very fine track record, which is from a diversified portfolio of assets, many of which are quite conservative. And yet it's unloved. It's on this big discount. And I think that's probably because British investors have difficulty getting their heads around exactly what Bill Ackman is up to. Yes, I think that's fair, isn't it? We should just talk about private equity. We've heard this week from a number of private equity trusts with their latest updates, typically third quarter NAVs, preliminary assessments in some cases, of course. What are your thoughts about this sector? We heard from uh, Harbourvest Global Private Equity this week, HVPE, and also from uh, Literacy Capital and also from Oakley Capital, all coming up with some announcements, updates. Overall, the recent performance of private equity trusts has been better than many people expected. Well, it has, and I think this is a bit of a surprise. So if you look at what has been performing reasonably well over the last six months in share price terms, actually three sectors stand out. One is India, one is technology, and the other one is private equity. So I don't think many people would have anticipated that actually you would have had a 16% return from 3i, a 15% return from Pantheon, 11% 11% return from HG Capital, 8% return from ICG Enterprise, all in share price terms. So this is in spite of the discount issues. And I think this is probably due to mounting evidence that actually the net asset values in this sector are reliable. And clearly there's been a great deal of discussion about whether we can have faith in net asset values. And I think that's mainly been generated from the alternative sector and it's bled into private equity. And yet this is a very well-established sector that's been going a long time. We've talked about this before. And what has happened is that actually asset sales have continued to be made at very good premium to the ruling valuations in these portfolios. And these trusts have continued to make money. And I think, therefore, actually, in spite of the scepticism around their valuations that is reflected in these very wide discounts, which still rule in this sector, there's been quite decent share price performance. Indeed. But as you say, there is also some differentiation between the trusts in terms of discounts as well. We know the literacy capital, which perhaps is a special case for a number of reasons, that's uh, trading actually very close to par. And then we've got a range from between sort of 20% to 60%, according to the list I'm looking at. And of course, a lot of these animals are actually very different. So it is quite difficult to generalize. Do you still think that there is this issue around cost disclosure is a factor? Or has it actually people now sort of gone past that? And as the share prices suggest, they have been moving reasonably well, that uh, actually that is not such a big issue as people have made it out to be. This is the issue of whether or not the fact that private equity trusts, along with some other trusts, have to disclose their costs as a percentage of NAV, Uh, And it looks very high and is therefore deterring a number of wealth managers and others from investing in the sector. What are your thoughts on that? That issue rumbles on and we can only hope for a a better resolution in time. And it does seem rational and sensible that at some point the legislation gets sorted out there and actually we have much fairer disclosure of costs. That may well be deterring some buyers. And it's a little difficult to gauge if you're not actually in the wealth management sector but you can certainly understand why that would be the case. And I suppose that is reflected actually in these very wide discounts, because in spite of actually good underlying performance, some reasonable share price performance, we could have seen a big bump in returns that we haven't had yet. And I, for one, never thought I'd have the opportunity to buy HG Capital Trust with its tremendous track record on a 22.5% discount, which is where it's standing now. I think it's extraordinary that you have a trust, again, like Harbourvest Global Private Equity on a 36% discount. And Pantheon, which just went through this big tender offer, is still on a 41 discount. So, yes, there's a lot of differentiation in the sector, but I think there are bargains to be found right across it, actually. And it's very hard, I think, to argue against that. But clearly, there are reasons why people are not buying these trusts. And I suppose the cost disclosure has to be amongst those. 
Finally then, uh, Andrew, let's just look forward a little bit. One of the interesting things is that uh, a lot of trusts do have continuation votes coming up or they have discount control metrics that have been breached and therefore have to decide what to do about the emergence of those discounts. There are quite a few of those coming up and I guess a number of investment trusts boards, at least, were not expecting that this would be an issue. Are there any names you would pick out of those that are coming up to important events, either continuation votes or redemption offers? What would you pick out of those that are coming up ahead of us? One I've been watching is Bellevue Healthcare Trust, BBH, which is a very interesting trust, actually. I think it has a very strong underlying argument for its investment across the healthcare spectrum. But this trust has in its structure an annual voluntary redemption facility, which means that actually shareholders can ask the trust for their money back once a year. And this historically has not been very important, Very few investors have asked for their money back because they understand the manager's remit and the manager's done a good job. They like the trust. But of course, what's happened now is that the trust has suffered along with the rest of the sector in terms of its discount. And the discount has widened out to more than 10%, which is very unusual for this trust. And that means actually that it's entirely rational for shareholders to ask for their money back at close to NAV, even if they actually do like the trust and they like the manager. And that redemption moment is just coming up. So the deadline for investors to express their wishes here is 2nd of November. And the likelihood is actually that quite a number of those shareholders will be asking for the cash. Now, this is a £750 million trust in terms of its assets, so it can certainly give some money back and still be viable. But the trust has indicated that it may well need to create a separate pool of assets here for the redemption shareholders, and they will receive the value of those assets. These are liquid assets. They're quoted equities, so It shouldn't be too difficult to realise the value there. But it just shows, actually, that no matter what the quality of the underlying trust is and its history and the quality of its management, you can still run into difficulties if you have these clauses in your prospectus and these facilities, which you never intended to work in this way. And that's true, of course, of wind-up votes and continuation votes and all sorts that are coming up, where the boards never really thought they'd be significant. But now in this current environment they are so this is a trust you say has performed very well since it came to the market it pays a decent dividend and is trading on a discount what of around six or seven percent but the dividend has grown substantially but the sector is just out of favor right has been out of favor for quite a while now and so you think that when investors are offered the chance to exit at around any of it, a lot of them will jump at it i guess you won't be doing that will you andrew with your holding Well, I do have a holding, actually. (laughs) And I've wrestled with this because I do like the trust. But there's also this issue that we spoke about earlier, that if you're wanting to invest in some of these tremendous discount opportunities that are presenting themselves, you've got to find some cash from somewhere, haven't you? And actually, if you're presented with a very rational case for getting an uplift on an exit, which you could, of course, then reinvest back into Bellevue shares in the market, or you could look elsewhere. I think actually that is quite compelling. It does depend on the level of the discount, of course, uh, and exactly how much you think you're going to get back because there will be some costs involved. Sometimes the margin just doesn't make it worthwhile and you should hold, but sometimes you do want to twist. So I think it's quite a difficult decision, this one. Well, on that interesting note, we will uh, end our discussion. Thank you, Andrew, very much. As you say, no shortage of news, plenty to talk about. That's one of the beauties of the investment trust sector and lots of decisions to be made. So I look forward to uh, talking to you again in one of our future podcasts. On then to uh, a continuation of my conversations at the AIC's Investment Company Showcase event last week, of which you may have heard three already. I have another five short conversations to share with you. First of these was with Nicholas Windling, manager of JP Morgan Japanese, who was on the podcast some months ago now. I asked him for an update on where we were in Japan at the moment. 
Well, I think the main message is that things are really different in Japan this time. The corporate governance story, which we've been talking about for a while, I mean, things have really accelerated this year with push from the Tokyo Stock Exchange for companies to come up with plans and what to do about valuations. So that is very, very positive. And, you know, we still see inflation picking up in Japan, we've got wages picking up. For the, this is the first time in 30 years. This is a very positive backdrop. I mean, one of the things I think people have struggle with in Japan this year is that it's been a good market but for a sterling denominated investor things haven't been so good and there again things just feel extremely cheap in Japan now I mean a litre of petrol is a pound yeah, zone one singles a pound nice it to feels, have yeah, yeah nice actually it's very expensive here but you know monetary policy is shifting maybe in the UK you know things are quite tight here monetary policy becoming a little less easy in Japan then, then there are reasons to think that that might it's possible that that would change so what you're saying is that the weakness of the yen the sort of chronic weakness of the yen has actually cut the returns that sterling investors uh, can get from Japan, even though the market itself has performed pretty well. That's right, yeah. And the, the other message you really want to get across is that there's a perception, I think, that because of the movement from the TSE and corporate government to Japan, that it should be the kind of very low value stocks, you know, value stocks that should benefit. And really, we think it's all companies in Japan should benefit. I mean, you don't have to sacrifice the quality of the business to benefit from the changes in a lot of the macro picture. So take an example of a company like Shinets Chemical, global number one in PVC and silicon wafers, $10 billion of cash on their balance sheet. And we've just started to see them make moves, partly because of the changes in corporate governments, but also partly because there's a generational shift in their management and the chairman who is, was 96 and the board who had an average of 81 that started to change and at the same time you're starting to see real improvements in their capital allocation and so you're not too worried by the slowdown in china i mean there's a, obviously a significant impact on trade in the in asia is that going to be a factor Japan is a cyclical market. It's a more cyclical market. Now, there are more cyclical companies in the Japanese market than there are. So it doesn't really matter whether it's China or it could be the US, it could be the U Europe. I mean, Japan as a market can be affected by it. Maybe not necessarily the companies we own, but certainly the market overall can be impacted by that. It's noticeable in Japan that if you look at tourists coming to Japan, every single country is back to a record high. If you strip out China, tourists are up 28% since 2019. It's great, except China. So it's one of some concerns, but I think it's just the point would be that Japan is a slightly more cyclical market than others anyway. And the other factor, of course, is that the Japanese market uh, historically has always moved quite sharply in response to foreign investor flows, either in or out of the country. Uh, have you been seeing any evidence of more flows coming in or, or Japanese investors repatriating from there's, other places? There's definitely more interest in Japan and it's become more high profile this year, maybe because the market's been doing well, maybe because Warren Buffett's biggest investments outside the US are in Japan. But still, I feel people are quite reluctant to, to pull the trigger. If you look when Abe was elected back in 2012-13, we had $250 billion come into the Japanese market. And over the next 10 years, the whole lot left. So far in this rally this year, we've had $35 billion come in. That's a really substantial gap. So I don't at all feel like people have missed it or you know, you know, ultimately people have heard it before that Japan is changing or this time is different. And it hasn't always played out that way. But I think we really do feel that, certainly on the corporate governance front, this is a really big shift, whether that be in what companies do with their cash allocations or cross shareholdings or just how they think about their balance sheet. This is a really seismic shift and we've not seen anything like this before. And it's supported by Japanese investors. It's not just the foreigners. Japanese investors are pushing for the same thing. That's a, a really significant shift from the last time we saw activists in Japan, which had been 2006, seven, where it didn't really work out that time. Next, I had a chance to talk to James Dupper, who is a manager of the Edinburgh Investment Trust, which uh, sits in the equity income sector and where he's been the manager for the past three and a half years, uh, having won the mandate uh, from the previous incumbent at that point. Uh, performance since then has been reasonably good and uh, done well against its peer group. I asked him what he'd been saying to the conference. Well, I think the drivers of that performance have been a mix. So Standout has been uh, Centrica, and it's a classic example of how a business can change. You know, it's the old British gas. If you think about the change in market structure, which we've seen in utilities, it has been dramatic, basically. And British gas has now actually been revealed to be a strong business. But the key point is it also 
actually has optionality for the future in terms of what it's going to achieve in terms of decarbonising our homes, if you think about British gas engineers, and then all that cash which it generates from its long-term gas projects, contracts, it is able to invest in high-return projects. And they had a CMD, and it was palpably obvious the undervaluation that was then embedded in the shares. So that's Centrica. We've also made decent money in M&S. That might sound a bit counterintuitive, but actually if you think about what they've achieved, they are gaining market share in food, they're gaining market share in clothing and home, they grasp the nettle, basically, in a way that finally, John Lewis has. Finally, to. finally, Basel. finally, absolutely. We're we're of the same era. We know <laughs> that M and S has been a tough share to hold, but actually, that means the valuation has been rock bottom. We've seen upgrades, and that has driven the share price. We've also seen good performance from BAE Systems. This is a business which is a structural grower, defence contractor, and I think what was really gratifying about the last set of results were actually the longer duration bits of their business, so the next generation fighter and the Australian nuclear submarine deal have shown good progress. So that long duration bit has also come in. Recent purchase such at Admiral, the insurer have come through very, very nicely. So it's been a mix is the message that has driven the outperformance over this 12 months. And indeed, as you know, the three year plus numbers are also good. And curiously, we're still at a discount. We're still at a 9% <laughs> discount. So that's the work to do. What can you do about that? I mean, it's a matter of sentiment, but there's a trend across the whole investment trust universe, of course. It's not unique to you by any means. What are the options that uh, the board has and uh, what can you do to help that? Yeah, so I think it's a mix of things, inevitably. The board, you can see from the RNSs, periodically buy in a small amount of shares. I think that is one sensible thing. And I think the other points which we have to do is, in the end, by endeavouring to perform well for share owners. In the end, time is a great healer. I think we're also dealing with the reality that the UK equity market has quasi pariah status at the moment. And I see that as a positive in a way from here, in that the valuations embedded in this portfolio are very low. And what I've learnt over my career is that valuation really trumps all things. So valuation's low, and I therefore think that actually from this kind of level of discount, the risk-reward is asymmetric or positive. Well, I was going to ask you about valuation, because obviously you've been around in this market for quite a long time. In terms of your portfolio then, what sort of valuation have you got across the portfolio as a whole, and how does that compare to... uh, shall we say, low points in the past, which there have been a few, but not since the global financial crisis or uh, going back to earlier recessions and so on. Yeah, I think it's difficult to generalise on that. But what we're generally seeing is the companies we own have produced really clear blue water in sales and earnings and dividends to the sort of pre-COVID level. You know, their strategic position is immensely stronger. People may have seen, for example, the the Whitbread results earlier this week. I mean, that was a classic parable for what's happening in the equity market at the moment. Because here you have a business that, um, quite consumer-facing business orientation, and what they're seeing is in supply terms, the competition supply, isn't what it was. If you think about travel lodge, pre pat waiting to happen, the independent struggling to come back, new construction not really happening because banks won't lend. So Whitbread has this clear runway of growth indeed in the results. They said that actually they were not anticipating supply to reach pre-COVID levels until 2028. These are dramatically different businesses. There are a lot of clouds on the macro horizon, the geopolitical risk out there at the moment. We've got an election coming up next year. But these are the kind of things that create bad sentiment, right, rather than necessarily reflecting where we're going next. So how would you describe your overall outlook? I mean, what should investors be thinking about these quite worrying macro developments we're seeing, you know, high interest rates, trouble in the Middle East, et cetera, et cetera? So I think it's been easy up until sort of COVID to park geopolitics. But now 
you've got to consider it. We've got a structural competition between two great powers, the US and China, which feels enduring. That, I think, leads to inflation being at a higher level, perhaps sort of three is the new two, if that makes sense in terms of our sort of thinking. So that is important. I think with the world becoming a more complicated place, which sadly we see in the newspapers and on the news in awful terms, an emphasis on resilience is really, really important in terms of thinking about the supply chains and the businesses we have. But I think in the main, we are invested in number ones and number twos in industries. And actually, generally, it can present opportunities and really where the tough areas are is if you're sort of over leveraged or you're an SME. The number ones and number twos in industries are generally making great strides against this backdrop. I also had a welcome opportunity to speak to Carlos Hardenberg, a manager of the Mobius Investment Trust. I say it's a good opportunity because he spends his time travelling around the world and it's uh, very rare to have a chance to speak to him face to face. I said to him that emerging markets have had a rough period of relative performance over the last five years, whether there were signs that that might be uh, coming to an end. First of all, you're absolutely right. It's been a very rough ride over the last five years. And despite all the challenges and the volatility and the war in Russia and the pandemic, we generated very strong performance, as you said. And the big question, of course, now is what's next for emerging markets. One of the big questions is China. China continues to um, pose a big unknown to the world because they are struggling with uh, reigniting the economic development, domestic consumption. The post-COVID recovery is much slower than everybody hoped for. But we are looking at emerging markets and China also in a more alternative way. So we're looking at, first of all, the fact that countries have actually deleveraged quite significantly, uh, that there are more and more exciting technology-based investment models, business models. There's a huge amount of entrepreneurial development in India. India is really one of the drivers of positive economic development with a lot of new business models, with a, a government supporting the private sector, with a lot of foreign direct investments, uh, and generally an environment where there's a political agenda which has the aim to establish India as one of the main powerhouses of the world and that's helping so we find a lot of opportunities and we think over the next five years India especially in the mid and small cap segment has a lot to offer Southeast Asia is benefiting from the recovery the recovery is slow the Chinese are beginning to travel again are beginning to consume again but also places like Vietnam Thailand Korea actually they are providing us with plenty of opportunities and to me the best way to deal with the China risk is to invest outside of China into businesses which are in a very good position in China as well and that's sort of something I'm more positive about. I think the degree of undervaluation of emerging markets when you look at book values, earnings, EV EBITDAs has not been that high in about 15 years so that massive discount is not going to last very long. And as soon as sort of a bit more appetite is coming from the US and European investors, we expect a re-rating. We're actually right, emerging markets generally have underperformed over the well, 10 years now, I think. The benchmark, yes. The benchmark, the benchmark I was benchmark, going to come yes. on to that. But of course, the point about your trust, maybe as investment trust, is you're not investing in the benchmark or you're not looking to be close to the benchmark. You're looking to outperform it by having a much more uh, differentiated, almost as kind of special situations type of approach. In, to a, in a way, special situations, but without exposing our investors to excessive risk. So we're focusing on, on mid caps. We have a very high active share, over 97%. We don't like the large businesses. We don't like huge banks, huge tech business, huge e-commerce businesses. They will see a lot of disruption. They will see a lot of regulatory pressure because in every country in the world, you see regulators going against the big guys, the monopolists. And it's the same in, in emerging markets. So we're focusing on these more innovative, often family-backed businesses, which are still around about three or four billion in market cap. And whether we are talking about, for example, technology that goes into semi-autonomous driving, technology that goes into new battery-based mobility systems, whatever it is, alternative energy. You have a lot of smaller businesses which cater into that field, or Internet of Things. You have a lot of companies, again, not the giants, but the smaller, the equivalent in German would be the Mittelstand, uh, the small and medium-sized enterprises, they are the winners. Who would have thought, for example, I know you have the opportunity to invest, of course, around the world, in certain countries you, you do stay clear of, but uh, yes, like you know, only a year ago, we were indeed, like Russia, only a year ago, everybody was writing off Latin America and so on. 
What's your view about that region in the world? Um, I think Latin America has a lot to offer, but you have to be very careful. You, uh, so we, we're not too keen on Argentina. We're not uh, too keen on countries where you have real political risks, which are totally out of our control. Uh, Brazil is a very open economy with a very diverse and deep capital market with a lot of entrepreneurial sort of power. Uh, a lot of ecosystems they build around education and industry, plus the support of the government, which has created, in many cases, some of the world's most competitive businesses in competitive industries. And of course, Brazil is in a good position because they're exporting, they're exporting to the US. They also have an agricultural sector, which is always one of the pillars of the economic stability. So with a five-year view or so, I would be more constructive on Brazil, also because the currency is not very uh, expensive at that point. No, it often <laughs> becomes uh, not very expensive. You're right. Right. And what about opportunities in Mexico and Vietnam, a place like that, which could benefit yeah. from safe shoring and all those kind French of trends? shoring, safe shoring, yeah, of course. Uh, you know, it's uh, nice to write about this in the FT and the <laughs> likes, and it sounds, you know, it's a very popular term, but um, it is something which is all often exaggerated. It's not that everybody has overnight shifted all the industrial assets from uh, less friendly nations to more friendly nations. This is more long-term trajectory. Mexico is very much, uh, to some degree, actually a proxy of the US, so they're very interconnected with the US market. The country doesn't have that many unique businesses to offer. There are uh, a couple of companies which are on our radar screen, but so far we haven't found similar businesses that we would otherwise find in Korea or, for example, in India. There's no comparison. Obviously, as I said, there's a lot of geopolitical concerns out there at the moment. The Middle East has uh, obviously added to that in the last uh, couple of weeks. But looking back over the last 20 years, it was the emerging markets that uh, kept the world stock market going through the global financial yes, crisis. Yes. And many of these countries have made some reforms which make them less oh, exposed yes. to yeah. uh, global uh, economic recession or trouble. Would you go so far as to say that actually some kind of investment in emerging markets can actually diversify your risk Absolutely. in trouble times in particular? It has. I mean, look at our performance. So we generated over 40% since we started the strategy. There's been very, very low correlation between our set of businesses in the portfolio and the rest of the world because we're looking for businesses which are, to a large degree, disruptors. They're growing really rapidly. They are catering to, as I said, fast-growing segments like alternative energy. Or, for example, we have a business in Korea which is focusing on atomic force microscopy, which uh, probably doesn't mean much to you now, but it's a highly competitive technology used to test semiconductors. Uh, so if you find the right stocks, you can make a great return no matter how the environment is. And that's sort of what we are trying to do. We are trying to work day and night to find the next business, which is not yet discovered, which can do really well over the next five years, even if uh, the dollar stays strong, interest rates stay high, and um, you may have the next trouble spot of a military conflict. So many of these businesses can be quite shielded from these external factors. And you rightly say, in the past, it was always boom and bust. And in the past, businesses in EM were very simple, consumer-oriented, resource-oriented, or, you know, the banks, the telecoms, that's the past. The future is a lot more innovation and patent-based and IP-based businesses. So I gather you've just come back from Pakistan. Tell us a little bit about where you've been globetrotting in the last few weeks and where you're going next. Uh, yeah, I mean, myself and the team, we've been traveling to Taiwan, Korea, Thailand, Hong Kong, We've been to Indonesia, we've been to Kazakhstan, we've been to Brazil. Uh, so we're constantly on the road trying to reconnect and connect with local entrepreneurs. And the next trip is probably going to be Brazil again. Uh, and we will focus at the moment quite a bit on India. So we spend about uh, two to three months a year in India. The final question. A lot of private investors seem to be concerned about the risk of a Chinese invasion of Taiwan. I, I don't know why that's suddenly become a kind of hot issue. What would you say to those people? I mean, is it something that we should be worrying about at this stage or not? I think you definitely have to worry about it, but I think we have to put things into context. At this point in time, we are convinced that the Chinese have other priorities. The top priority is to stabilize the economy, to revitalize domestic consumption, to ensure that China stays in the World Trade Organization, to ensure China wants to ensure that they receive the right capital, that they strengthen local businesses. 
all of this would be thrown overboard on the day where they declare war on Taiwan. So I don't think it is an expectation which would guide you to the right investments at this stage. But of course, you have to be careful. I also had the chance to speak to Gervais Williams, a well-known figure in the UK small cap universe, both investment trusts and open-ended funds, and in this context, a manager of the Diversified Income Trust. I asked him what the theme of his presentation to the conference had been. I've been doing uh, something all about dividends. It's all about dividends. And in a way, I think that's the cornerstone of investment. If you look back in historic data in, in stock markets, the only thing that would make any difference on the initial yield you buy it and how much it changes. Valuation over the years makes less and less and less effect, particularly over 10 or 20 years. And so ultimately, as long as you can buy an asset, which is hopefully on a reasonable yield, but more importantly, grows its dividends after that, then that's the cornerstone of all investment return. So whilst you can buy companies with capital growth, ultimately, a bit like Apple, they only really generate long-term sustainable returns if they generate surplus cash and income. Among many other things, you're a manager of a Diversified Income Trust. Yeah. What is the uh, yield on that trust at the moment, and uh, what is the dividend growth track record like for that trust? So the trust is currently, with a lot of small companies come under pressure. They might be growing their dividends beautifully, but because there's an overhang of sellers, a lot of oil uh, effective valuation has come down. So the yield, which was set up when it was set up, was 4% at the time it launched in 2011. It's now 52 And right. it's grown at 6.5% on average since we set the fund up. Right, so it's done exactly what you set out to do. And so the message to investors who are looking at that trust is hang in there, basically. Specifically, actually, um, if anything, start moving away from capital growth strategies put more capital towards good and growing income. It's a bit like Aesop's tale. You know, pairs have had a great run. Tortoise is the way forward. The tortoise wins the race. And this is primarily because we're now in a a period that appears to be, at least uh, as far as we can tell, we're going to have much higher interest rates for a period of time. I don't know what your views on that. I agree with that. And that tends to be a period when actually dividend investing tends to produce better return. Well, I mean, income stocks are typically capital intensive and they've invested capital. And when the cost of capital goes up, there's less competition. Right. It's a wonderful time. So what sort of companies are featuring at the top of your holdings at the moment? So there's a lot of mainstream companies. So we've had recent results from Sabre, for example, which is a motor insurance group. But most particularly, what's thrilling about that is you have to buy car insurance, whether you like it or not. And obviously, as you probably know, car insurance rates have gone up an awful long way recently. So I just had mine delivered, yes, yes exactly. So, so when you wake up, there's a lot. So there's, there's companies like that, but just a range of companies, some big companies, some medium-sized companies, some small cap. A lot of the aim-listed companies are really standing on chronically low dividend. The largest holding at the moment is XPS, which is a pension advisory business. It was yielding about six, two or three years ago. Of course, the income's come up since then. They grew their dividend 18% last year. This dividend yield's just under five now. But even so, even five or four, growing at 18%, they're not necessarily growing the income going forward at that rate. But it doesn't get more complicated than that. So uh, you mentioned AIM market, and that's been interesting. And you wrote some interesting research into AIM a few years ago, pointing out it was about to do very well. But unfortunately, in the last two or three years, it's really gone through into a dive, hasn't it? Now, what's behind that? What is the reason for that, really, do you think, apart from just general market movement? Well, what's interesting about the AIM market isn't so much it's gone down, but the FTSE 100 has gone up, right? So the difference between the AIM market and the FTSE (laughs) market is even extreme. So what we've really seen is flat-out selling from UK oil selling. It's coming to an end, but it's been going on, going. And what's been happening is that actually as you keep selling of course your share prices because there's not many other buyers share prices have been going down why has the FTSE 100 gone up? because global investors are buying tortoises we happen to be very good in the tortoise department in the UK so international investors are buying European income stocks particularly UK income stocks and we're seeing that more than offsetting local selling there's going to be a sort of catch up trade in my view in the smaller end of the market long term small caps outperform big caps if the UK market continues to be the best performing market as I think it will be over the next 20 years I think we've entered a super cycle I just want to repeat of that. income outperforming going forward. Oh, I see. Yeah, I okay. think the smaller caps will be the best performing part of one of the best performing markets. We think diverse income trust is superbly positioned for the future. Just on that, that final part about the AIM, though, I mean, AIM market has been very successful in attracting new companies to Absolutely. come to AIM, and we're the envy of the world as far as that market is concerned. Yeah. But the trouble is that they may be deterred from coming forward and raising money and so on in the AIM market if valuations remain. I think the value of being listed has been very uncertain over recent years. You've got all these regulations, subject to short attacks and all the other things which happen. But going forward, we think that it's going to get very difficult to raise capital. And the great advantage of being listed is one that you've got a share price, but more importantly, you can go to institutions to raise capital. As companies become insolvent, you can buy viable business, which have been over-levered for nominal prices, 
put back in working capital and make out a complete value. And that's great for big companies. We saw them buy made.com for 3.4 million. It had been valued at five or 700 million when it was listed, right? But the trouble with Dex, and it's a lovely company, is it starts at 9 billion. If you start at 900 million or better still at 90 million, same deal, you may need to raise external capital, you may need to raise 50 million to be safe. So you start off with 150 million, if you have 300 million, which is what, say it may be worth, it's probably not six, worth 600 million, but say it's worth 300 million, then you, you'll make out like a big bandit. That is why small companies outperform the 60s, 70s. UK economy was rubbish, sterling was really weak, uh, but most particularly, smallness outperforms. And, and if we are entering an uncertain period, we are very, very excited about the nearly unique advantage of UK market, which is that we've got a lot of small micro cap growth companies. One other question about small companies you mentioned. Mighton does have a UK microcap trust as well, which is very small companies in market capitalization. Right. Now, it's often said that these days everybody says you need to have a trust that's 250 million or 400 million or 500 million figure sort of varies in order to be viable long term. But that doesn't really apply to microcap, does it? It can't apply to microcap because you might hit some sort of capacity level. So do you think there's still a place for these small microcap trusts which are under the radar perhaps or too small for some of the wealth managers to own? One of the wonderful things about investment trusts is they can right size their investment. So the problem is if you have a microcap unitized vehicle, assuming it, you know we've got a good bounce, it was making heaps of money, and it got ambushed with cash and it went to 500 million or a billion, it couldn't be a microcap going forward. Right? So an investment trust is actually the appropriate vehicle, not because you know you don't get redemptions, but more importantly because you can actually make sure you don't get too many subscriptions on the way up. The wonderful thing about that trust is it's there, it's only 60 million market cap at the moment, but the truth is when it comes right, uh, we can actually make sure we don't get too many subscribers. That's the thing I'm worried about. Next, I had a chance to speak to Laura Elkin, manager of AEW UK, the Diversified Commercial Property Trust, which has the distinction of having the narrowest discount in the sector after a period in which the whole sector has sold off notably and capital values have been marked down significantly over the last 12 months. I asked her whether there was any sign of a turn in the commercial property market from what she's been seeing recently. On the whole, yes. And I think our own recent numbers show that. Uh, we put out our latest NAV announcement yesterday and our valuation for the previous quarter showed a modest increase. So we're very pleased with that and our values have remained stable since Q4 last year. I wouldn't say that I expect that to be the case for the entirety of the real estate market. I think there are still some sectors in which we will see some stabilisation over coming periods, most notably offices and particularly secondary offices. I think they still have some way to go, but I would have said the sector as a whole has stabilised capital-wise. Uh, and what sort of yield is the trust operating at the moment and how uh, sustainable is it? There have been some questions about whether or not you're able to... Uh, Sustain the dividend, uh, given that it's not entirely been covered for the last few quarters. Yes. So one of the reasons why our dividend has not seen full cover over recent periods is that we made some quite large sales last summer and we took significant profit in doing that. Um, we were then slower on the reinvestment with the volatility that we saw in the market post Liz Truss. Having that slightly longer approach to our reinvestment period has allowed us to access significantly greater value. So I'm actually really pleased that we did that. I think we got our timing absolutely spot on with the sales we made last summer. And I've been really pleased with the things we've been able to buy since. In terms of our dividend looking forward, well, starting with looking backwards, we've paid our dividend now, stable dividend, two pence per share per quarter for the last 32 consecutive quarters. So I think we're demonstrating to the market the approach that our board have taken, which is that during periods that our dividend isn't covered by earnings, we are covering it through our capital profit. And I've talked about that significant capital profit that we took last summer. Now, we've spent the last year building back to a position of having much higher levels of investment. We've made a lot of purchases. We've recycled some lower yielding assets into higher yielding assets. We found the past 12 months to be a very fruitful time for asset management and that has also driven up our income stream. So we've spent the last 12 months significantly rebuilding our earnings and they look to be in a very healthy position going forward. And of course the market does seem to believe you on this because you do trade at a very narrow discount compared to most of the peer group, I think that's fair to say. Yes, we do. And I would like to think that that is some level of recognition for perhaps the quality of our strategy. The fact that now, I think now is a very good time to be a value investor and to find opportunity in the market. 
So yes, it seems that the market has recognised that and of course I'm very pleased. We are trading, of course, below our net asset value, which I have full conviction in. I would very much like to see that trading in line with the net asset value, but that's not the current market that we're in. Right. Are you saying that they're basically for someone like you, which has uh, the ability to invest across all the sectors in the commercial property world, it has become something of a buyer's market in one or two areas? Would that be fair to say? Absolutely. I think that's been definitely the case for the last 12 months. As I said, we entered that period having a significant amount of money to invest. We've made roughly five purchases, totaling just under 50 million in the last 12 months. Now all of those have been at significantly more accretive pricing, more attractive pricing than we would have been able to access in the prior 12 months. We were able to buy excellent quality locations, high yielding assets, and nine times out of 10, we are buying them where their capital values are in line with their residual values. Effectively, we have underwritten the capital side and we have bought high quality, high yielding assets. Right, so looking forward, I mean, how important is it for the sector that we do see a peak in interest rates? Do you think that is the thing that's still driving sentiment towards property companies or other factors work? Or is it more a fear of recession? What do you need for the kind of sentiment towards the sector to change? I think there are a number of factors at work. Of course, we had some not particularly encouraging CPI news yesterday, and we've seen a a knock on consumer confidence as a result of that. Of course, I would love to have seen interest rates peak already. Now, only time will tell. I think the thing that encourages me is that during this period of significant interest rate growth and, and high inflation that we've seen, I've been really impressed by the robustness of our tenants and the fact that, yes, in the past quarter, we have had to make one significant right off because of a a tenant going under but that really has been an anomaly so I'm really impressed by how robust the sector has been and I just think we need to continue to weather this period and at some point things in the wider economy will stabilise and I think we're then fully prepared to take advantage of that. This week also we've seen uh, news from M&G that they're closing their open-ended property fund So I imagine you're going to tell me that actually you're very happy to be running a closed-ended vehicle at this point, uh, going through the cycle. Does it actually help you, the investment trust structure? I certainly like it. You know, it it provides me as a manager with a a closed pool of capital that I can have some confidence over, some assurance over sort of retaining that and and using it. You know, from the sales that we made last summer, I didn't have to have any concerns about needing to return some of that capital as we entered that period of volatility. I could look ahead to looking at our investment pipeline and looking at spending capex on assets that need it as I normally would in the course of business. So for me as a manager, yes, I find it to be an excellent structure. So that's it for this week, an extended edition of the podcast to include those conversations at the AIC's Investment Company Showcase event. More from us next week, when, of course, we expect further news in the investment trust sector as a lot of trusts consider their options as their discounts are wide. Thank you for listening. The Moneymakers Weekly Investment Trust podcast is independently produced and edited and is listed on all leading podcast channels. You can also sign up at the website money-makers.co to be notified every time a new podcast is available. Please note these podcasts are provided for educational purposes only and nothing you have heard from any of the speakers should be regarded as constituting investment advice. If you want more news, analysis, interviews and other investment trust content, don't forget to look at the Moneymakers Circle, available now for a modest subscription at the website.